Um, but we have a lot of things to get through today, so we have to start. And this is maybe a more relaxed little presentation. I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of us getting engaged in projects. Because I think when I joined the Gale office 14 years ago, we didn't maybe think so much about how to engage with people. And this is something we've learned over the years to develop tools to help perhaps deliver better projects. Um, and I've called this taking people on a journey. And we've referred to this idea of the journey um, on earlier days because there's a very big difference, I think, between professionals who have an education, who can understand documents and drawings and ordinary people. And of course, there's even big differences between professionals. This is the beginning of my career. Um, I started my career in urbanism very early, as you can see. And maybe, maybe when I was six years old, I said the most intelligent thing I've ever said. Because my mother was going crazy, oh, this, this city, or this, this, when will it be finished? It's everywhere. And I said, Mom, it's a city. It will never be finished. And actually, I think that's something we have to get used to this idea. It's never finished. It's always changing. The reality is changing every day. When I was six years old, the reality changed every day. New ideas came every day. And we have to accept that in the cities we work with, there is constant change. Governments change, markets change, demographics change, attitudes change, trends change. We could never have predicted the technology we have that we use every day. So all of these things we have to accept is always changing. The other important thing um, that fascinated me as a child was the idea of that the city was home to so many different people, so many different lives in parallel. And it was always very exciting to think that you know, there were all these different perspectives because everybody was different. And actually, why, in a, in a, in a really practical way, why do we have cities? You know, it's, it's not so convenient to push everybody together in a small area, but actually it is very convenient to live close to people that are different from you. The real advantage of living in a city is there are other people that can do things that you can't do. And it's that difference that we have to embrace. But the problem is in planning with all these different people, it's very hard. It's, you know, if you think, oh, we make everything the same, we repeat, oh, that's very ordered. But we need to make something which accommodates lots of different needs and lots of different kinds of people. So I want to talk how we started on this idea of the co-creative process. Cities produce these things, documents, beautiful brochures, well-made, with nice graphic designs, you know, and lots of really good ideas. And most of them go on the, the shelf in the architect's office and stay there. And I think that one of the greatest wastes of human resources is spending so much time and energy and love making these great projects, these great ideas, and they stay on the shelf. And we have to understand how can we get these great ideas off the shelf and become a living thing, not a document, but a thing that lives in people's minds. The problem with the document is you have to read it. And people are maybe a little bit lazy. And you know, you know yeah, I read it, you know. No, nobody read it. And, and unless you can explain the document in like 30 seconds, or you know, they, they talk about an elevator pitch that you can explain to the mayor in one minute, the point, you will lose people. So we need to find a way to make these things live more and recognize that a lot of people don't read and most people don't understand the drawings. The, the, the language that we use, it's kind of like for politicians often, for ordinary people, it's like Arabic, it's Greek, it's hieroglyphics. And at the same time, people are embarrassed 
because people don't want to say that they don't understand. Mm, looks very nice. But I've got no idea what it is. So we need to find gentle ways. And it's not just, you know, the, the grandmother that doesn't understand this. Maybe the mayor cannot read the drawing. Maybe some very important people, you know, the economist, the city manager, maybe he doesn't understand the drawing. So we need to find a gentle way, even with very important people, to explain what's happening. And we talk about citizen engagement, and for most people it turns into something like this. You've got a, a hall with people, most of them have got white hair, because the only ones who've got time to come are the ones with white hair. And maybe they just want to come and complain because, oh, the young people in this city have no respect. Look at these cans of beer. And they play the music too loud. And you know, then they are, or they want to complain about the dog shit. Oh, the dog shit is such a problem in the city. And then you explain, oh, well, thank you. Actually, the theme of today is about mobility. And people want to talk about completely different things. So we also have a kind of, I, I, I've done um, public engagement, I think in almost every continent. And I've never been to a public meeting. Whatever the subject, if it's about transport, about densification, people will talk about dog shit. Because this is what they, they see as being city life. And, I, and we have this thing, what does engagement mean? Does it mean just information? We're telling you, we're doing this project. Or you listen, okay, um, we're doing this project. What do you think? Um, are you actually going to say, okay, well, have a dialogue? Maybe can you have a dialogue about it? And then the next question is, are you prepared to have some influence? Can the people you're dialoguing with have an influence? And ultimately, can you decide together? And Cities work on all different levels. Many cities stay on this level. And when they say consultation, they mean this. We've given you information. And so I think, I mean, this is also something about human, human nature, and we have, we have this problem even when we have a master class. It's kind of like one person talking and everybody else listening. And this is very frustrating in a process for something important, like making a plan for a city because everybody has knowledge. Everybody's sitting on knowledge, and it's very hard because in this format, if everybody should talk the same time as me, we need to spend two weeks in this room listening to each other. So we need to find a more efficient way to listen to each other. Otherwise, of course, you know, there will be someone who talks all the time, like me, you know, or maybe somebody very, very smart and very confident will get up and also talk. And then there's maybe somebody who's a bit more shy, who actually knows much more facts about the project, and they don't see anything. So we need to find another way, and this is what we're constantly experimenting with, to find a way of harvesting, and is that hard to translate, harvesting? Harvesting the knowledge of people, so we can get all of the knowledge from the people that like to talk, from the quiet, smart people, the people with more experience. And so if we could find a way of working in groups, so everybody gets a chance to talk, structuring the groups, to, and, and you know, maybe we have to make sure there's somebody like a, a sheepdog in every group making sure that everybody speaks. Like, oh, you've been very quiet. Why are you not saying anything? You know, and find out all those things. And then these groups can then represent back to the big group. And of course, maybe somebody doesn't agree. Like, no, no, that's not what I said. I don't agree with the group. But it's a way of taking all of this knowledge, synthesizing it, organizing it, and listening to each other. And basically, we're trying to find lots of different ways, appropriate ways, constantly evolving ways, to harvest the knowledge that people have, to harvest the experience people have, and the understanding they have. And for us, it started in a very unglamorous place. We started in a village in Scotland called Neilston, and they had a lot of problems with unemployment and no investment, 
and they wanted to have a workshop. And we arrived one night and we had no idea what we were going to do. And it was this kind of situation, all these old people complaining. And we thought, how can we get everybody? And so myself and my colleague Eva, we stayed up all night. And we thought we have to make, invent a game where people imagine doing something else. The one great thing we, we managed to get was we managed to make a big plan, a plan of the village with everybody's house on the village. And this was wonderful because well, a lot of people that had problems understanding the plan, but when we taught them to read the plan, they said, oh, this is my house, this is the school, you know, this is the, the church. And people could begin to understand how they were related to each other. And, and the fact that their house was on the big plan made them feel very proud. And it was a, a starting point for a dialogue. And then we asked the people to imagine different perspectives. And I'll talk more about the different perspectives later. And to kind of map, you know, how they'd want to do. And the next thing we started doing with a big map. And then I think something which is maybe the most useful tool we have is post-its. And what I discovered was because there's this whole culture of the document, the, this very fine printed document that nobody reads, um, and the plans that nobody can understand. Um, there's a lot of prestige. People are embarrassed to say, they're embarrassed, oh, I didn't read the document, I didn't read the paper, you know, oh, I can't read, you know, I, I can't read this plan. But, you know, anyone could write two words on a post-it, and you can put it out there. I think, I think, I think we need to close this road and put a post-it. And they said, no, that's a stupid idea. Okay. And it's no big deal. It's very easy to write a post-it and it's very easy to take it away again. And it sounds a bit simplistic, but this allows us to test things. We can have a, a, a conversation and also everybody feels that they can like participate. You know, because everybody can write two words and put a post-it you know, and, and feel that they're participating. And also it's very physical. Like, I, ah, it's like, you know, it's like having communion, you know, it's, everybody goes, you know, and puts the post-it. And so it's also a physical way of showing, this is my idea. And I think this theater of the project is also very important. And so in this very modest exercise, we learned a lot. Um, and you can see this is the, the first, the very first time we made a map with post-its and just kind of writing some words and different colors because we thought different groups should have different colors. And from that we learned, I learned that maps are really hard for people to understand. So the next time we did, I knew that we had to use an aerial photograph because this is kind of abstract, but this people kind of understand because, oh, the green is the park. Oh, those green circles are trees. Oh, this red is the roof. Well, all these small things, that's the cemetery. And people can understand that better. So since then, we always work with aerial photographs for engagement, even with the mayor and the economists, the smart people, because then everybody understands. And of course, it's a bit more expensive. Every time, they, oh, do we have to do color prints? That's a bit more expensive. But it's a small thing which makes a big difference in the communication. So. The next time we kind of put all these things together, we had this project in a place called Schävlinge in Sweden, a small community. And it was a bit complicated project because it was a very small community. The government resort, the local government was very, very small. The, there was one planner for the town, part-time, um, 60 years old. I'll show you in a minute. And the project was basically a sausage factory. This is the sausage factory, meat processing factory. And the meat processing factory was closed down because, I don't know, it moved somewhere else. And the idea was to redevelop the site for mixed use, for commercial activities and housing. Um, and it was very convenient because there was a railway and they thought maybe if they could build something next to the railway, they could really kick the economy back into motion. 
But it was very hard to communicate this because they, you know, the, 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 the developing company, they would buy two pages in the newspaper and give information. But of course, nobody reads that. Maybe they read the headline and the date. So when we had the first information meeting, I was, I was meeting unemployed butchers because people just saw sausage factory meeting and they didn't read everything about the change of use and people were coming asking for work in the sausage factory. And we were trying to explain, well, we're not making sausages anymore. We're building apartments and trying to make sure, and like the, 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 the difference, in, I mean, it was two different worlds. So we realized we had to find ways to engage with people, to take them on this journey that the future was going to be different. This is the planning department. This is Marianne, 60 years old. Um, until this time, she only did like maybe small projects like a kitchen extension for a house or a small change in a road. And suddenly she was in charge of this whole big site, the biggest project in her life, the biggest project this small town had ever made. And what we had to do was to get Marianne and our colleagues in the council out of the office and get out and look. Just let's, let's try and understand where we are. So we got everybody on bikes, we got the councillors on bikes, we got citizens on bikes, and we walked about, we cycled about, and we got to know the place. Let's not decide, let's just know the place we're in. You know, and we went to see all of the highlights of this town. This was the main square, and one of the councillors was very proud. He said, oh, we have a beautiful square. We've got a beautiful, the surface is beautiful. And, and so we went to look at the square, and it's true that the surface, the floor, was very nice. But actually, the rest wasn't so nice. And so this was just kind of like building up experiences of doing things together. We went, we went and talked to the local baker. And actually, we discovered the one really good thing in this small town, the bakery was really good. And then the baker, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of the baker. She knew everything. And again, go out and talk to people. And then the fact that later I said, oh, I talked to the baker. And the fact that I talked to the baker gave me so much status. Because people knew, oh, you know, you know the baker. Uh -huh. But how do you get people to sort of change, uh, change their view of things? And I think one of the challenges is that we had groups of professionals coming. We had engineers, landscape architects, different architects, developing companies who were just thinking their product, their services. These are the services we have to do. These are the products we have to sell. And then we have the citizens who also can't imagine living a different life. And so how do you bring these different groups together? And how can you take them on this journey and maybe step out of their normal lives? So you know, we understand that you're a very angry old man and you're very frustrated, and you think the young people are very badly behaved, but for the next two hours, can we make get a different perspective? So we started doing something, and it was a, a little bit sensitive because it was a kind of role playing, and not everybody's comfortable with that, but to take people on a journey, I'm saying, can you imagine seeing this place with other people's eyes? So just for the next hour or two, step out of the life that you're living now, and just imagine, oh, we know you're the smartest engineer in the region. You know? You know, we know you've lived in this village for 20 years. But now can we just think with new eyes you know, and imagine putting other glasses on and seeing this place in a new way. And so we divided them into groups and we gave them themes to imagine the future citizens, the future people living in this place. And so, we could talk about it. who are the most important people in the world? Your children. And we could start talking about, well, actually, if we want this place really to work, we have to have the children perspective. What will make families want to live here? The most important decision you make in your life. Maybe it's what, 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 what course you choose at the university. Maybe it's who you marry. The next one is, where are you going to live? 
This is the biggest decision. I mean, as a couple, that's the biggest decision you make. We're going to we're going to buy a house here. We're going to make the biggest investment. I'm going to you know we're going to we're going to borrow money from our parents-in-law, so we're going to be slaves, so we can live here. It's the biggest decision you make, and it's often around the children. Where do we want our children to grow up? So if you want to talk seriously about the future of your village or your town or your city, how can you make it the place that people will make that life choice? This is where we want to bring up our children. So you present this in a very serious way, and people, oh, this is a very important group. And you have to think about family life, how it works every day, how to have a wonderful childhood, how we can capture those things. So another group, we've got this kind of um, difficult group, the teenagers, the ones who are really dissatisfied. And this is actually something very, very tragic because in a way, young people, 7, 16, 17, 18 years old, have this amazing potential. And what's very sad, in many communities, if you ask them, 17, 18 years old, when we ask them in Shevlinge, what's your dream? Moving from here. And they were really serious. That all they could imagine was that they would have a better life somewhere else. And this is tragic because at this very important point in your life, choosing to, to be somewhere else, but like, wow, I want to be here where it's happening. And so this idea of how could we get young people to want to stay in this place and see a future for themselves in this place, that it was a cool place to be. The next one was this idea of the university city, the city of education. Whether it's a university or a college, cities that have an education, a huge, place of education have a huge advantage because talented young people go there, often they'll meet their first girlfriend, important boyfriend, and maybe they'll stay there. And this is a very significant thing. Also, we know that um, companies are looking for educated people. So if there's a place of education, private companies want to invest because they know they can get good workers. So this idea of the place of education was a really important theme and thinking, what will education look like in the future? And how can we be an attractive place to come and learn? Then there was something about recognizing internationalization. Immigrants come, foreign investors come. How can we make our local place more attractive? And maybe we shouldn't try, you know, and, and, and sometimes, you know, it was really, really pathetic things. Like, you know, the, the, the mayor of this village, he wanted to build a skyscraper. You know, so we'd be more like New York. And of course, you have to make it. And actually, if anyone from New York was to come to, to this village, you know, they would just laugh at the, at the skyscraper. So we have to find a way, well, what's the DNA of this place? What is the uniqueness? What's the specialness that will make foreigners go, wow, this is really exciting. This is really different. This is really interesting. You know, and finding a way to embrace multiculturalism along with the true identity of the place. Then we talked about the future of work. What will future workplaces like? We knew there wouldn't be any more sausage factories, you know, but maybe there could be some small artisan work, co-working, the way we're working, more flexible local manufacturing, and trying to imagine the kind of places that would employ, where those, this, this future of work might exist. And then we just think, old gold. Every country has got more and more old people. And they've got time. They can spend time in places. They spend time, they go out, they bring life to places. Some of them have got very good pensions. And it's very good if they come with their pension and spend that pension locally. So if we can capture this kind of group now, this is a very interesting group to get to come and live. And, and, if, and again, if you're imagining we're, we're, we're doing groups, that for the, the mayor and the politicians and the experts and the architects, if they can imagine these needs, we can design better things. And finally, we recognize the importance of culture. Leisure and culture is maybe one of the biggest industries we have. It's not just something that's fun to do. It's an area where a lot of money is made. And if we recognize this perspective, 
we can start designing for it. So by taking all of these different themed groups, we can then get people to work together, a small table, and start talking not about, I'm the engineer, I know so much about this, or I've lived here 30 years and this place will never be good. No, now we have a task. We have to imagine what this place will be like in the future. What will it be like to be the most attractive city for families in Sweden? And so with this task, they can become focused and we can start to make a map. We can make a map of the place. We can first of all map the things that are already there because there's always things already there and we can talk about, well, actually, we've got some nice parks or we have a very nice river and we can start put together the things that are there and then think, well, actually, we've got this nice river, but there's nowhere to sit at the river. Or we have this very nice football, football club, but the football club is on the other side of the highway and no, the children cannot get there. So we can start to understand the challenges, what's there and what's needed. And using this mapping method, we can together map an idea is working in the small group and the small group brings their map and then on a big map, they can work together and around the big map have this discussion. And this is the map, see, this, is, this is the sporting, this is the leisure map. And then we can layer the different visions of the place on top of each other. And because we've got the different perspectives, you can see some places have got lots of color and those are the places that everybody wants to be in. Some places are maybe more specialized. We can map both what's there and also what people are dreaming of. So it's a kind of a way of structuring and actually getting a lot of information, but in a process that also everybody can follow and understand where it came from. As a little side project, the, 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 this town called Schevlinge was famous in Sweden because it was, the, it, was the, it was the community which spent the least amount of money per child in education. It was the stingiest education town in Sweden. And that was actually quite an interesting challenge because we thought we should do something with the children. And we decided to do a pedagogical competition. We did a pedagogical competition first with the teachers and the teachers were really not the most inspired at that time. But we, we, we gave them a one day Gale masterclass and we said, okay, now we give you the knowledge. You, make, you do something with your children. And so the different groups of teachers made a competition to design, to design an event for children. And the ones who won, the group, the three teachers who won, they got, they got a trip to Venice. So it was a, a small investment by the developer, but it was very exciting for these teachers to do this thing, win a trip to Venice. That was in the spring. In the autumn, we did uh, the competition for the children. The children actually won, won computers for their school. Um, but what was great was when we launched the final plan, we coincided the final plan launch with the children's competition. So the local people didn't really care about the plan that we were making, but maybe their kid was gonna get a prize. And so rather than me or some expert coming to talk about the project, when a 10 year old kid who lives in the community stands up and explains about the new park that will be built, that there will be water and trees and places to play, there will be bike lanes. And when the 10 year old explains about the bike lanes, it's much stronger in the local community than somebody from outside does it. So what, what we've done was rather than the, 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 the developer company making lots of printed things, buying pages in the newspaper, engaging the community in workshops, events, working through the school, we were able to make it much more interesting. So the final plan and giving people, taking people on this journey. So I, I was talking to Myra yesterday, there's a kind of a mise-en-scene, like how do you make the theater of a workshop? The first thing, small groups, round, roundish tables. Um, I would say seven is the magic number. Like, uh, the, you know, you don't want the group to be dominated too much by one person. 
mixed groups, different people in the same group. It's very important that people understand there are many perspectives because it's very easy, oh, well, I'm the expert, I know everything. Different voices so that you understand that there are different groups. And making it maybe as comfortable as possible, you know, bring coffee, you know, bring cookies, you know, make it comfortable. And then find a way to use the post-its. Very easy, everybody knows how to use a post-it. And maybe some inspiration pictures because sometimes it's very hard to describe. <clears throat> and if there are some images, just some pictures of atmospheres, of moods, you can start something like this. And then by putting a picture and saying, no, 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 it's not like that. It should be more like this. And it, it's a, it makes the conversation very easy because you can start to talk about the kind of place you want. Not the kind of architecture, not the traffic solution, but the kind of place it will be. And then, as you know, you can start to make a collage, you know, and then have this standing up meeting, these standing up discussions, and a kind of dynamic with different people doing different things. So you move about, and you're part of making it. And then, always from the group, we're going to the big map, the big event, and it's very exciting when you go from this, you know, from the small groups. And then it's a bit like, like I said, it's like communion. You go forward and one at a time, you start putting the post-its on the, on, on, on the big map. And this becomes a very strong thing. And it becomes very symbolic when the different participants physically go and like the city engineer says, yes, I agree that everybody here wants me to make this road more narrow. And publicly he puts the post-it on the map. And that becomes a very strong thing because it's not just saying like, yeah, we could do that. It's a physical action. So there's a kind of a theater or a mise-en-scene in this that makes people you know, very, very active in the role. And of course, it becomes very it be easy to follow. It means that we can have a very big group kind of following the process of what's going on because it's actually very complicated things we're discussing. And I've discovered it's very good that there's a microphone. First of all, because not everybody can hear because you not know, everybody's, you know, but if there's one microphone, only one person can talk at a time. And you need to have a little, a little bit of discipline for that. And it's important that everybody sticks to the subject. Everybody should talk. And we have to make sure that you plant people to make sure that everybody talks. So nobody can go home and say, yeah, I couldn't say anything. Everybody got the opportunity to talk. And so, for example, like we have these imaginary exercises, like now we're going to plan the city for the dog owner. So this is just a silly example. You know, like how can we map, you know, you know, the things that are there for dog owners? And then we can say, well, how can we prioritize? What are the three most important potentials? You know, what are the three most, the three most important challenges? And by making the groups discuss and concentrate, and then they bring the synthesis with these ideas to the big map and putting these things on the big map. And sometimes there are very complex challenges because you've got these different groups, like we have one group working, can we get two groups to synthesize their ideas? Because this is what you have to do, we cannot take everybody's, and we can actually put the groups together, and this is a situation here where you have one group, who then have to synthesize with another group. And can we design a way to make that possible? And you know, which post-its do you move over? And because the post-its can go back and forward, this can be a very dynamic thing. You know, and it's, it seems maybe very simplistic, but it's a way of including that everybody understands what's going on. Because if you do this in a document, it's impossible to understand. So I, I, I apologize, maybe think, oh, this is like playing but this is a way of taking people on the journey. And this idea of the roadmap, which I think you've been working with, like you know, this idea of now, sooner or later, because the project starts now. And we can start to think like, also in this timeline, there are often opportunities. Like, okay, you know, there are, you know, every year there's Christmas. Christmas is a really good chance for doing. You can have a you can have a Christmas market and an event. You know, every year there's a new year. 
the new year is maybe an opportunity to do something. You know, there's maybe a, a disaster, a catastrophe, there's a, an accident. Um, Jan Gale, usually one of Jan Gale's famous quotes is, if you want to bring a community together, burn down the school. You know, maybe something happens that you can use as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, to inspire a chance to come together. You know, very often we have elections. The election is maybe something to work to. So on this timeline, there may be some real events that you can coincide with. And then you can start to map the software and the hardware, what you've already been doing in this line. But what's important with these tools is the idea is to make it quite easy and as many people as possible can participate and feel that they've participated. And this is an example where you, know, you can put this just with post-its on the wall, a white wall, and you can see now, sooner or later, is this hardware or is this software? And you can discuss together and say, no, it's, you know, is this, oh, I think that's quite big, you know, and you can have this discussion as you map on the wall the roadmap. So, that was the, the, the process. And just to finish with an example of the, maybe the most extreme project we've worked with, this was Christ Church in New Zealand. 2011, there was an earthquake which destroyed the entire town center. Since this photograph's taken, these other buildings have also been demolished. Um, we, had a, we were working in Christ Church two years earlier. We had made a public space, public life project we had proposed, I think, 113 different um, improvements to the city, and I think the city had made two. You know, because there was no rush, it's a small conservative town, you know, and changing the parking is difficult, and you know, there were all these reasons for not doing anything, so we had made this very nice report, but you know, nothing much had actually really happened. Then this happened, you know, and suddenly it was a very different situation. Um, and suddenly, you know, I, f I had to wear a hard hat when I went to the meetings. And this is what the city looked like. And in this situation, you know, maybe there's a, it's really time to really talk about what kind of city do you want to live in. And I know you see this is this, the, 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 the tall buildings are leaning in different directions. And you can see this is the metal bridge is bent. The, the Catholic cathedral. And so, really a big mess. And of course, people have lost their homes. Um, but also something kind of quite nice has happened. Because in the situation where like, for the fourth time, you're cleaning the sludge from the street because you know with an earthquake, this, this, um, this mud comes up. If you're doing this with your neighbors, you actually get to know the neighbors really well. And if the water is switched off and you have to share the toilet with your neighbors for three months, your relationship changes as well. So we discovered that in this situation, although people had been through a lot of hardship, they were actually very open to, to discussing things and they were actually feeling more neighborly than they maybe ever did before. Our job at Gale, um, I moved to Christchurch for three months, and then once a month, someone else came to join me, so we were always two people from Gale, and a bit like in Mar de Plata, we were placed inside the council. So myself and one colleague, we became a member of the council staff, and we worked, and we had 100 days to make a new plan. And how could we start doing that? And so we had to start work on serious investigation, but at the same time, we had to bring everybody with us. And we had this project called Share an Idea. And it started online. So there was a kind of a, a, a site, Share an Idea, and you could go on online. But we had to make events as well, because not everybody uses the computer, not everybody knows this technology. And the same thing with the, with the mood photographs and the post-its, but on a much bigger scale. We had to do this in a football stadium. So just scaling up so everybody could be involved. So a bit of education. I was telling like, you know, three times a day I would give a lecture for a thousand people about, you know, here this is 
what kind of city do you want? Remember, Aris, my godson with the puppy. You know, everybody in Christ Church knows about my godson. And capturing all of the ideas. These were, these were the, the children's ideas. You see, this is what Iceland says, jumping off a cliff into water. Um, foot, a lot of football, zoo. And then we even made this workshop with Lego. Um, you, know, you feel like maybe, maybe I'm sponsored now by Lego. Uh, I can promise you we didn't get any, I, I still don't get any free Lego. I'm really disappointed. But what was nice when we made this Lego workshop was actually not just the children made things, but actually a lot of the adults. And by building things, people could talk about their experiences and actually the conversations next to the model were more interesting maybe than the models. And capturing all of the ideas um, in many different ways. And then online, we had this, this online tool and then you see it says find an idea because I don't know what my idea is, but I, I've been thinking about bicycles. And so you can look and find the bicycle ideas and you can add an idea. So you can search for ideas and then you can add to it. And then we got this kind of result and we used a, a special computer program that told us the most frequently used words. So um, green spaces, people, these were the most frequently used words and it's an intelligent. So if you say no green or no bicycle, it knows to put that in a different department. And every day I would get like a list of the, the status of the project and like a phone book of ideas like to read every night. And as I said before, 98% of the ideas were very reasonable, very sensible, very practical. And we got 106,000 ideas. And this big gave us, gave us such power because we had 106,000 ideas and you know, we all these words. And basically people wanted more green, more people friendly, more pedestrian friendly, more trees. They wanted less cars, less traffic, less concrete, less bus. New Zealand is the country in the world that uses cars the most, more than the United States. So this was very interesting. And then we had to take these ideas and, you know, we, we, thought we had 10 themes, but, you know, 10 themes was too many. So we ended up with five themes. And then we said, how can we present this? So on the wall of the local gallery, we just stuck stuff on the wall. And we had this, the wall, you see, 28 days to go. We had 100 days. So we had this calendar, and we just put stuff on the wall, and people could walk past and write comments and put a post-it. And it was a living, a living document. Um, we, we had a, a funny thing where all of the meetings were in the corridor, standing up. If you're in the corridor and everybody can hear you, people make more public-spirited decisions than if they're sitting locked inside a conference room. You know, because, you know, who's listening to me? Yes, I think we should plant more trees. Um, also, if people are standing up, they make the decisions quicker. And having these kind of meetings. Now, there was sometimes hard negotiation. These are three engineers. You know, and you can just, the, the body language tells you everything. You know, I'm talking, oh, okay, the, the, the fourth one, he's just sending text messages. Like, you know, he's, you know and, I, and you know how excited I get? And they're like, oh. So there has to be a lot of negotiation on the, on the side because, you know, some people need extra persuasion and you just take time, you know. And, and maybe the design work, it happens in the middle of the night because it's the only time you get to do things. The reality is, and this is, I don't know if you can see this, you know, this is Excel. Everybody knows Excel, the Excel spreadsheet. This is the reality of planning. And if, if you think people cannot read a plan or cannot read a document, do you believe anybody is gonna read this? And this is what steers the city. And so we needed to find a way to for people to understand what was happening on this, on this, you know, because if you come to a meeting and says, yes, do you agree? <laughs> yes, 
you know, no, nobody wants to be stupid. So we kind of made a, a live Excel with post-its on the wall. And sometimes there were some very difficult decisions. For example, the city wanted to build a conference center first, like with the money they had, they would build a conference center. The public wanted to have a swimming pool. You know, I, I don't care about conference. My ki- I want my kids to learn to swim. You know, we've had an earthquake. I want a swimming pool. But they said, no, no. But if we build a conference center, there will be 10 hotels built. The 10 hotels will employ 1,500 people. Okay. You know, and then you can explain those things. Actually, the community were not convinced. They want the swimming pool. But we could explain these things in a way that people could understand the kind of decisions they were being made and why. And finally, they made a document, and we included the original people in the document. So the people could present their idea and say, this is my idea, and they could explain that they imagined this different kind of waterfront. You know, they wanted to take away the cars from the river, and this is... Gabriel, this was Gabriel's idea to take away the cars, and actually a lot of people agreed with Gabriel, and to make a place for people on the waterfront. And so we made the plan filled with these ideas and explaining the change, like taking the cars, how much space there would be. You know, this was Marilyn, who felt that in front of the cathedral there was too much concrete, so we tried to reimagine, and we didn't make a design. We just said, it could be something like this, because someone else will make the design. But of course, the place in front of the cathedral could be greener. You know, and we could imagine in the future how traffic might look like. Um, Maybe there could be a a tramway. One of the most interesting questions was two-way streets. And actually, I wished I talked about that yesterday. Two-way streets completely changes the experience of driving. And there was a special online survey about driving and they interview drivers because you know if you've got a one-way system you drive kind of like that but if you've got a two-way system you can go more efficiently Uh, there was a huge support from the driving community to have more two-way streets and then for the architecture the idea that no building would be taller than the tallest tree and that was a very simple trees are actually very tall but so you could build seven stories but that's the height of the tallest tree. And that was an idea that everybody could understand. The tallest tree, and only the cathedral would be allowed to be taller than the trees. And this was a very simple you know, concept that everybody could understand about the problem of tall buildings. We could try to explain how the blocks would accommodate everything, and we had this kind of very simple drawings. And then explaining, yes, this is what the street could be like, with the cathedral at the tallest. And when we finally presented the project, the very conservative press were like, oh, this is actually quite good. And they phoned all the different stakeholder groups and the usual people who like to complain. But everybody the newspaper phoned had actually contributed to the plan. And because the plan represented people's views, they felt comfortable with it. Now to get started, and we've been talking about this all the time, it's make something happen now. What can we do now? Well, we can have containers. And the shopkeepers, the shopkeepers still live there. They still have a business run. They cannot wait five years to build a building so I can reopen my shop in five years' time. So we could have the old shops could reopen in containers with this a very simple kind of cheap architecture so that the trading could continue and that the town could continue as a, as a shopping place. And as I showed you yesterday, funny interventions, small, quick things to remind people that this, this new city was on its way. Um, one final word. This method has been used in other places. We have a very honored guest uh, with us. We have Patricia from Sao Paulo. And there's a fantastic work happening in Sao Paulo over the last few years. And part of this, they have embraced a lot of our techniques. This is the iPhone snapshots. And there's been a fantastic um, way of using these images to bring in as many of the people working in the cities as possible. And 
Patricia has been involved in a whole series of workshops to involve as many people in the city so they understand what's going on. So repeating the same exercise over and again. So, so everybody can be part of this process and know what's going on and capturing these ideas in, in, in the same way. And of course, what's really great, they've also done a really great online tool and you know some similar results. And I was really excited when I saw this because this is about handing over the tools and it was reinterpreted actually, I think, Many of the things that happened in Sao Paulo, and you can, you, you can ask Patricia about that herself, were actually more sophisticated because it was developed. Every time you pass it on, it was developed. So all of this is about taking people on a journey. I've probably talked longer than I was supposed to, but this is, it's, some of it might seem a little bit simplistic, but it's really important that we can find tools that include everybody because people can feel they're participating and people don't need to feel that they're stupid. I think in every situation you need to adapt it. And I think every time we've taken these tools somewhere else, it changes, it evolves, it gets better. And I'm sure Myra as well, you've got lots of stories. Myra has been working very hard developing this, and particularly in Latin America. Okay, I think I'll hand over now to Ola. Oh, a break, oh break, okay. Coffee break, or any question, yeah? When we develop the groups, I'm seeing there's always a leader. Is that the, the leader is, is uh, coming through a consensus of the group or is being provided by the company? Uh, well, it's very, it's very important that, that the leader is not a boss. Not the boss. I would say I would describe it in every group. We try to place um, a shepherd and a sheepdog. If you understand, the, does, does that translate shepherd and sheepdog? The shepherd is the one guiding, and then there's the sheepdog making sure that everybody takes part. We have to be very careful because, I mean, I, I, sometimes important people want to have this job. And that's very sensitive because, you know, I mean, my last, I was doing a project with a city in Sweden last month, and the city architect really insisted that he would be a group leader. And this was terrible because he just bossed over everyone. So in that situation, when you have strong characters with opinion, I try to say, well, actually, we cannot waste your time doing this administrative role. You know, we need you to contribute actively in the group. So it's much better if you're a member of the group that you don't waste your time doing that, this administration role. So you have to, I mean, I would say a huge part of what we do is also a kind of psychology. And you'll know that, I mean, like everybody should have some psychology education for working in planning because we have to deal with the people's ego. But you need to make sure that the, the synthesis happens in a fair way. But the insurance policy is that the group gets the chance when they make the presentation to say, I don't agree. My group are saying this, but as you are, or, or sometimes in the case of this, this Swedish architect, what happened was his group just said like, we don't agree. That's not what we said. We said something else. And the forum of the workshop allows that to happen. But it's, it's, it's a, a very important thing, this group dynamic. And I'd say every time you do it, it's different. Any other questions? Or just really one quote, oh yes. ¿Cómo se capitaliza esa dinámica que se genera con las personas? Eh, ¿cómo, sí, ¿cómo, eh, ¿Cómo se capitaliza esa dinámica que se genera entre las personas? Y luego, David, wait a minute. ¿Y, y, y, cómo, y, y cómo después se les involucra en, en lo que continúa, verdad? En que sean partícipes también del monitoreo. O sea, no genera una dinámica donde todos aportan y, y bueno, están, están todos así muy motivados y luego, ¿cómo, cómo eso se mantiene a lo largo del proceso? Ok, es una really good question and a really hard answer. Um, that I, I, have to, I, have to, I have to make the confession that it, sometimes you don't manage it. Actually, the really sad part, and I, the, the, the Christchurch story, actually has a very shaky history 
because this was maybe the most successful large-scale project where everyone was involved. What happened was four families that owned land in Christchurch went to the central government, lobbied the central government, and the central government took, and you saw in the film, they took away the rule book for doing the plan. And this became a very, very long process, but the strong thing was, and you see in the end of the film, that because so many people were involved, there became like a folk movement. But I think you're right, it's really vital, like how do we keep it going? Because one of the risks is you create all this hope and this enthusiasm and pff, it crashes. What happens when this, you know, what, you know, this really great thing, then there's a change of government and the new mayor doesn't like the project? Just, just because it was the previous mayor who made it. You know, or what you do when this really brilliant guy in the city leaves his job and goes to work somewhere else. Like what happens? Like does the project collapse? So I think it's really important about building up a culture of the project, ensuring that there are as many owners as possible so that it can carry on. It doesn't land on one person. And just this idea of building up a culture of the project, there's no simple answer. I think this is something we could talk about actually after lunch, that's a very good theme. How do you keep the project alive? Because you create this enthusiasm and you build this parklet and it's really cool. And then actually after six months, this parklet's falling apart and nobody remembers why we did it. And you're back to where you started. So it's how do you keep it growing? And I think that's a really good theme for this afternoon. Alguna pregunta más? They want their coffee. Bueno, entonces vamos a la pausa. Gracias. Thank you.